Well, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? Spring is in the air. I see some of my friends out here, my gardening friends from the community gardens on the west side, and glad to have some folks from the, also from the extension here today. I'm excited. This is kind of right up my alley. So let's just get right to it. Let's get growing. Um, I'm Jeff Woodard. I'm the Director of Marketing and Community Relations for the McLean County Museum of History. And again, we welcome you here to the program. This program is being live streamed, and we want to give a special thank you to our live stream sponsor, WGLT, Bloomington Normals Public Media, part of the NPR Network. The Lunch and Learn series is made possible with the support of our presenting sponsor, MCK Advisors. So today, we welcome U of I Extension educator, Brittany Haig, who will share information on plants that engage the power of your senses to create an immersive nature experience and elevate your garden's sensory environment. Raised on a grain farm in McLean County, Brittany earned her BS and MS degrees in agriculture and horticulture from ISU. She now serves Livingston, McLean, and Woodford counties as a horticulture educator for the U of I Extension. And her work focuses on youth ed education and community programming. So please help me give a warm welcome to our guest, Brittany. Thanks so much, Jeff, for inviting me here today. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, I apologize if things are a little clunky with my arm, but we're going to do it today. Um, so sensory gardens, I'm very passionate about sensory gardens. Sensory gardens or engaging with plants is really something anybody can do, um, no matter your age, no matter your ability. It's no matter where you're at, you can involve, you can engage with, with gardens, with plants. Uh, so I want you to think about the last time you were in your garden or a garden and you actually sat and you listened to the birds chirping or the, bir or the bees buzzing or you smelled what was going on in the garden, what was growing. You breathed in, you relaxed, you saw the beautiful flowers you planted. I could probably bet a lot of you haven't done this in a while or you do it very rarely. Is that true? How many of you just go and work in the garden, get it done, you weed, and you don't appreciate, you don't connect with your garden? Yeah, we're, we're all guilty of that. Um, but the garden is such a wonderful place to stimulate our senses. And stimulating our senses can improve our well-being, our health, our overall happiness. So sensory gardens, you know, any garden can be a sensory garden, right? But sensory gardens are thoughtfully designed. The plants are specific. They're arranged in a specific order to engage one or more of the five basic senses. And they're really designed to draw people in. In a garden, like botanical garden, I think you just walk through the paths, you see the beautiful flowers, but sensory gardens are designed to draw people in and connect. They want to look up close, they want to smell, they want to be with the plant. So they're designed that people engage with the garden. Um, they also are really designed for any space, size that you have. If you have a patio garden, apartment, you can plant a sensory garden in little containers. If you have a little space in your garden, you know, five by five, you can have a sensory garden. Or if you're at a school and you have hundreds of Square, square feet to garden. You can plant a sensory garden. It's all gonna look a little different, but it can be any size that you have available. Um, this, this sweet little girl, we often think of sensory gardens for children, but they can be for any age, any ability. They don't just have to be for kids, but we, we, we oftentimes think of, of them as kids. So sensory gardens are gonna stimulate, they're gonna engage our senses and and by doing this, it allows us to connect with nature, to build that appreciation. And this is going to help us practice that sense of mindfulness. So mindfulness can mean a lot of different things. Today, I'm going to say mindfulness means being aware of your thoughts and your actions in the moment. 
And so being mindful in our garden, um, there's a lot, a lot of research on the effects of gardens on our health and our well-being. But being mindful in the garden can make us more appreciating of, of life. It can um, help improve our focus, our attention, our memory. Uh, I know we all could use that. Um, and it also decreases stress. How many of you totally know what I'm talking about? You're out in your garden, it's a stressful day, you're out there and you're like, I feel better just, just pulling those weeds or being around. So there, there's research, but then we all know being out in a garden um, is so good for us. And then how can a sensory garden be used? Um, and the, the possibilities are endless. They're really multifunctional. Um, if we're a school or a preschool, a nature center, or even a home, we can use it as a teaching garden, engaging those senses, but then also learning shapes, learning colors, learning about the life cycles. Um, sensory gardens can also be, just the purpose can be relaxing. Um, we can have it at our house. It can be our space that we relax, we disconnect, we go there to, to really calm, calm us and to appreciate nature. Uh, sensory gardens are also used a lot in therapies. Um, this could be maybe individuals with um, physical or developmental disabilities. It could be individuals with sensory processing disorders or even some cognitive challenges. Um, it could, could be used in a lot of different ways. But these are going to be very design specific. We want it to be a safe space. We want it to be a practical space. And we want to design for who's going to use our garden. So are you, is the whole purpose a children's garden? Um, if so, you're, you're going to want to make it smaller. Our kids are small. They don't want to be overwhelmed and have these giant plants or giant spaces. So small and very thoughtful. Um, are you creating the sensory garden for visually impaired? If that's the case, we need to make our beds narrower so that they don't have to reach so far over. Um, is our garden for tactile learners, the ones that are going to learn best by touching instead of touching and doing instead of just looking at the garden? Um, or is it a therapeutic garden? And is, that a, is it at a hospital, a senior center, somewhere where these patients, these participants, are going to benefit from either passive or active involvement with plants or plant activities? So a lot of different ways to, to use a sensory garden. This is um, a picture of a garden, Chicago Botanic Garden, and it's a great reminder um, to have raised beds or really great pathways that make it accessible to all. Choosing plants. So like I said, any garden um, is really a sensory garden. Any plant, right? It, it, it engages our senses. Um, but some plants are definitely more exciting than others. So just, just like we are um, designing with, for any garden, we want to vary the plant's height, the form, the texture, the bloom times. We don't want the garden to be blooming all the same week of July. We want it blooming from April to, through October. Um, same for height. We don't want it all to be the same level. That's kind of boring. Um, we also want to consider hardy to area. So if you're OK with planting annuals every year, that's fine. If you want to save a little bit of money and have those plants come back every year, you're going to want to plant perennials. Our hardy zone is um, 5A, 6B here in um, McLean County. So depending on the winter, um, those plants are, are going to survive here. You can check the tags of your plants to make sure they're, they're hardy to this area. Um, and we also want to make sure our plants are people friendly. There are a lot of plants out there that um, have varying levels of toxicity. There are some that are highly, highly poisonous, like the castor bean or lily of the valley, where it, is, it could cause severe um, illnesses or even death. So we, we want to avoid those. Um, but there are also some plants that cause like skin irritation that we need to be mindful of. Um, like baby's breath is, for, is one, for example, that could cause some irritation. Um, also a lot of bulbs, like tulip, daffodil, hyacinth. If you touch the, the bulb part when you're planting it, some of those can cause skin irritation. So always um, be mindful of your plant selection and that it's not poisonous, it's not toxic. The Poison Control Center has a, a great list of uh, poisonous plants. You can find all kinds of references online, university research, resources that tell you if it's going to cause skin irritation or it's going to be toxic. So make sure that it, it's safe for people. Uh, and then, of course, you always want to avoid plants that 
require pesticides. We're gonna be up close, we're gonna be engaging with those plants. We don't want plants that get a lot of insects or diseases, so we don't be, be applying pesticides. So plants that are easy to grow. All right, so we're gonna jump into our, our five senses, so sight. Um, we're going to include those different colors of blooms and foliage. When we're thinking about um, color in the garden, it doesn't have to mean a flower. So this is the polka dot plant, and it has really interesting pink um, variegation in it. So think about the foliage as well as the flowers when you're designing, um, designing a garden. There's, we also wanna think about color. So our warm colors, like these beautiful tulips I picked this morning. Um, these, the warm colors, the, the reds, the yellows, the oranges are gonna be energizing. The purples, the whites, the blues are gonna be more calming. So we wanna include um, a variety of all those, being purposeful of, of what area you're designing um, with color. Um, you're gonna use contrasting colors, textures. I, I'm really big on textures, making sure you have small leaves and big leaves and grasses, um, just to provide interest in the garden. We always wanna think about um, habit, so we have trailing plants, we have creeping plants that'll be nice ground covers, but you can also add an arbor or a trellis in the garden and have vines growing up it for, for height. Um, and we wanna include plants that will bloom at different seasons, but then also the time of day. So our seasons are pretty easy. It's like summer, we got it. We have plants that bloom in the summer, um, but our spring bloomers, our bulbs are great for the, the bees. And then our fall bloomers, they're, they're great for the bees too and not a lot are blooming. Um, but flowers that bloom at a different time of day. Um, how many of you are familiar with gazanias? Yeah, so have you ever noticed that they close up if it's cloudy or at night? They, um, they'll, they'll do like a little, their flower will, will close up and then as sun comes out, they open back up. Um, but there are a lot of different flowers like that. For example, this tulip this morning, it was completely closed when I pulled it from the garden. It was a um, tight little bud. I took it into my office and it, within five minutes it opened up. So with the heat, with the light, it opened up. So think about um, different flowers that'll open and close with the weather, or with the, the lights. Um, and then think about different leaf patterns, leaf shapes, um, unusual bark or stem color the red twig dogwood would add really interesting color and, and form in the, the garden. So it doesn't just have to be the flower. You think about the whole plant. And then I'm gonna go over a few plants. I could be here all day talking about really cool plants, but I'm just gonna go over a few that um, I, I love for a sensory garden. Um, our top left picture is sunflowers. There are so many varieties of um, different heights, different colors different habits of sunflowers now. And they're just so cheery, I love them. It like makes you smile. So you can add tall sunflowers in the back of a garden or in a, you could use it for cutting, but just so bright and cheery. Um, our next picture, the, the yellow foliage of a birch. So think about fall color in our sensory garden as well. We have a lot of beautiful fall color, yellow, oranges, browns, um, and, and even the, the reds. Um, during the year, but fall color is um, something we can't forget about. Also the peeling bark of the birch, that is so cool, I love it. Um, there are a lot of trees that have really interesting bark. Some of it, um, like for example, I think of beech tree. When it's younger, it's, it's not quite as cool, but as it gets older, it's gonna um, look a little bit different. So it's gonna mature and change. Um, the peeling bark adds a really cool texture, like uh, people are gonna be tempted to to peel it off, um, but just a really cool sight in the garden. So snapdragons, this is an amazing colored snapdragon, but really any bedding plant, like that's their purpose, the bedding plants at our garden centers, is to provide, provide that pop of color for the summer. They're annuals, they're fairly reasonably priced, you, you plant them in mass and they're gonna add that, that instant color for us. Our bottom left picture, Japanese maple, um, this adds a lot of color with our, the red leaves. The leaves are gonna provide movement in the wind, and then the, the height of the tree is gonna provide structure. This, this is one of my favorite um, 
trees to add to, to small gardens. They're, they can be pricey, but they are so worth it. They're really beautiful. How about the zinnias? You cannot have a garden without zinnias. They grow so easy by seed. They're, it's cheap. Um, so many beautiful colors, but then the butterflies. You're going to have tons of butterflies that are going to add color, add movement to the garden as well. Um, so lots of fun there. So let's see. Next, we're moving on to smell. Like smell. Smell is one of our strongest human senses. It brings back so many. It, it can trigger a lot of memories for people. Uh, but we have so many great scents in the garden. Just that, that the earthy aromas. Um, Freshly cut grass, who, like when you drove by your neighbor and you're like, it smells like fresh, fresh cut grass. Um, being a farm girl, I'm like that with freshly tilled ground. A couple weeks ago, I, I was driving and I was like, I think somebody's working ground. Like you can smell the soil. So it's, there's, our earth provides so many wonderful scents besides the floral scents. Um, and they trigger so many memories. Um, you can probably all think of a flower or a scent that like I think of a, a perfume my grandma used to wear, and I occasionally will smell it um, going through a store or somewhere like, there's that smell, it's my grandma. So it's, it's such a, a cool sense in that it, provi it, it triggers memory. Um, lilac is another one for me. I smell lilac and I think about my childhood and, and cutting the lilacs. Um, so think about that maybe if this is a, a senior center or you're working at a hospital of providing scents that would, would trigger memory for people. So there are a lot of fragrant plants, fragrant flowers. Some of them are going to naturally re release scent. So our roses, um, wonderful smelling lilac, um, but others have to be crushed or rubbed in your hand to release that smell. So still wonderfully scented, just have to interact with it a little bit more. And then um, we have so many sweet smells. Gardenia is probably one of my favorite flowers to have on my patio. Um, kind of tricky to grow, but so worth it because it's like that scent is so fresh, um, so relaxing. And then our herbs are wonderful gardens, to ha wonderful plants to have in our garden for senses for a variety of different reasons. I'll talk about them a lot, but herbs smell wonderful. Some of them will pro provide that scent um, just walking through, but a lot of them will be crushed. You can also um, taste the herbs as well. But herbs... Um, are very easy to grow and they're multi, multi-purpose too. So some of our plants for smell, lavender, it's like perfect, right? It has fragrant foliage and flowers and we can cut them and use them. I have an activity back here that we can use the lavender for later. Marigolds, who likes the smell of marigolds? There's a few of you who absolutely despises the smell of marigolds. Yeah, I'm one of those. I don't, I don't love the smell of marigolds. Um, they can repel deer. They can repel rabbits. Um, they love, the pollinators love them too. But yeah, they're one of those things that you love them or you hate them. They definitely have that really strong musky smell. Um, and our top right picture is, um, are the scented geraniums. These come in a variety of different scents. You can do like fruits or mints, different nuts. Um, a popular one we see in the garden center is the citronella geranium. It has like, repel mosquitoes. It really doesn't repel mosquitoes. Um, it's just, it smells exactly like citronella. It's very pleasant, but it really doesn't repel mosquitoes like, it, like it's advertised. Um, bottom left are basil plants. Um, I, there's nothing like the smell of basil, and then you can also use it as pesto, absolutely. And then our middle picture on the bottom is viburnum, so Korean spice viburnums. Another, we can't forget about our shrubs and our trees when we're planting our sensory garden. It doesn't just have to be low-growing plants. We can add structure. Korean spice viburnum bloom in the spring, very, very sweet smell. And then, of course, our lilac. I don't think a garden would be complete without a, a lilac blooming. They'll bloom soon, um, but those are wonderful, wonderful scents. Touch. So the, this touch, this tactile sense is really complex. Um, it's a sense on our skin and under our skin. So you think, like, here's my arm, my leg, my face. And it's more than just touching. It's, um, you can, temperature, pain, um, different 
our whole body is feeling the sense. It's not just our fingers by touching it. Um, so we have to think about that when we're providing plants for, for this tactile sense. Um, it's not just going to be our fingers that are, are doing this one. So to provide that um, engage, or engagement with our senses for touch, this tactile, we want to provide a lot of different textures. And, and this doesn't just have to be a leaf. This can be the bark of a tree. It can be the flower seed head. Or it can be the fruit, the smooth tomatoes. So it, we always think about the, the leaf and how the leaf feels, but we don't have to. It can be everything. You also want to include a variety of senses or a variety of textures. So the rough, the smooth, the sticky. Petunias are sticky. You guys know what I'm talking about. Petunias are sticky. Um, and then the fuzzy leaves, of course. And then these plants, the whole purpose of touch is to touch them. So they need to withstand a lot of um, rubbing or um, crushing anything that people are going to be um, using this plant for. They need to, it needs to be sturdy. It needs to withstand some, some touch. So be aware of that. Don't put anything really fragile, really sensitive in there. So our touch plants. Top left, like the classic sensory garden plant for tactile is lamb's ear. So lamb's ear is covered in t uh, tiny hairs. The purpose of the hairs are really to um, help with drought tolerance to, to keep that moisture in the leaf. But it makes the leaf seriously feel like a lamb's ear. Very, very soft. Middle top is straw flower. So this one's really cool. It feels like tissue paper when you put it in your hand. They're really long lasting, but then you can cut them and have them as everlasting dried flowers as well. So just a really interesting texture. It doesn't even feel real. It feels like paper. Um, top right succulent guard, or succulents. These um, have really fleshy, squishy leaves to hold water. So again, drought tolerance and just a lot of different varieties of succulents that we can have in the garden. Different size leaves, different colors, different growth habits. The bottom left is Rattlesnake Master. This is a native to Illinois, super cool plant. It has really rigid, um, spiky stems, but then the thistle-like flower head is really pokey as well. So this adds like a gray blue color to the garden, but then it, it really looks like it would hurt when you touch it, but it, it doesn't. It's, it's a really neat plant. Um, the center one is Celosia. There's three different types of Celosia. This one is the feathered celosia. And then we have our um, plumed, which is like a, um, like a papery type. And then there's the uh, plumosa. That looks like the coral or the brains. So all of them are so bright and cheery, but then they feel really cool too, like coral, really soft. And then the bottom right is artemisia. And this one has really fine foliage. I think I could like rub my hands through it all day. It's very soft, fluffy type plant. It's, it has a really like cool temperature to it too, but a really soft feeling plant. And then sound. So we live in central Illinois where we have a lot of wind. I feel like it's windy every day. Um, so plants are gonna naturally make sound in the wind. We're gonna have a lot of natural happening sounds. Um, with grasses, with leaves. Um, but you can also use, have like dried seed pods in the garden that would produce sound. A rattlesnake master, master is one of those that has the dried seed pod, the false blue indigo. Um, but those, the clumping bamboo, the ornamental grasses, those clumps are gonna just really provide wind um, or sound in the wind. But we do wanna provide contra uh, contrasting sounds. We don't want it all to hear sound the same. Um, so some that are softer, some are louder. Um, so varying those, those materials. Even like dried leaves or rocks on the ground are gonna provide some sound. Um, leaves are really loud when they're dried and crunchy in the fall, so it's okay to leave some of those for that sound. Um, and then it's okay to add wind chimes or water to the garden to produce the sound. There's like, wind chimes are so relaxing sounding, so is water. Um, but also consider adding bird feeders or bird baths because those are gonna attract the birds and then the birds are going to 
provide the songs and the calls that um, would add sound to the garden. So plants for sound, we have our um, top left, ornamental grasses like switchgrass, miscanthus, form these dense clumps that are really beautiful, provide movement and sound in the garden. This middle top picture is called pig squeak. And it's got its name because if you rub the leaf between your fingers, it sounds like a pig squeaking. So I should have brought one today, I didn't. Um, but interesting name and then the, the leaf. Top right is love in a mist. Really, really pretty blue flower. But then when it dries, the seed pod looks kind of dangerous. Um, but it, it rattles. There's seeds inside and it, it um, makes that noise. The bottom left, um, so this is providing seed, this echinacea, purple coneflower, providing seed for the birds in our garden. So it's okay to let some of our flowers go to seed to attract those birds that are again gonna make the, the sounds, the colors in the garden. Um, middle picture leaves, like raking the leaves up in a pile and jumping in them, it's so much fun. But then the, the crunching, like you guys know what I'm talking about, the crunching of the leaves when you walk. And then the bottom right picture, one of my favorite plants, Baptisia. So beautiful, most often blue, there's also white or yellow um, spike. But then when, you dr when the flower dries, or the seed for seeds form, flower pods dry, it's these really brown, really cool brown pods that you shake them and it's, it does sound like a rattle. It's really loud. Um, so you can either leave them in the garden or cut them and use them as like musical instruments. It's pretty cool. And then taste. Most of the time we think of our, our gardens for taste, right? We eat, we eat a lot of produce from our garden. So providing that um, variety of those healthy fresh fruits, the fruits, the vegetables, the herbs, is a great way to introduce taste in the garden. A lot of our, or some of our flowers are edible. So like nasturtiums, pansies, those can be added to salads or eaten in the garden. Again, our herbs, um, herbs are so flavorful, so delicious. Basil, chives, and lemon balm can just be picked right from the garden and, and chewed on. Um, and then fruits. So we have um, a lot of fruit at my house. These are my, my two kids, my daughter's cut off. Um, we have a lot of fruit at my house and this has provided so much sen sensory engagement for my children that I never quite realized. I thought, hey, we're gonna grow these fruit and we're gonna preserve them, and, but they love harvesting the berries. They, in the summer, go out there. First thing, we're gonna go check, see if there's any raspberries. Okay, they run out there, find them, and just like shovel them in their mouths, eating them. But you know what? The, I made the mistake of picking them one day and taking them inside, washing them, putting them in the fridge. They didn't eat a single one. So they, my kids, they love that, that sensory experience, the finding the color, the ripe color, getting the juice on their hands, tasting the, the warm, fresh berry in their mouth. They love them, but, but they won't eat them in the house when they're cold or washed or already picked. So just, it was, it's, it was a very interesting observation, and I'm like, hey, that's fine, you eat them out there. Um, but something that could be easily done for anybody to, to go pick that fresh produce and eat it right there in the garden. Um, we can also plant plants for recipes, like uh, salsa or pizza, where all those plants together would remind us of our favorite foods, the smells, the taste, all that. Uh, so when we are encouraging taste in our garden, we do want to be very careful that we identify them. They're, like we said, there are a lot of plants that are toxic or um, could, could cause some upset tummies. So we don't want to combine plants that are edible with um, toxic plants. We also want to label our plants very clearly, like, hey, this one's okay to eat. So always be mindful of, of clearly identifying. But it's okay if you don't encourage tasting in your sensory garden or don't encourage it all the time. Maybe have them use other senses to identify plants that they eat or have them imagine, like close your eyes and imagine eating a juicy, ripe strawberry. So other ways that they can engage um, by taste if, if they're not able to, to safely eat the plants at that time. 
because we always want to think about safety. All right, so with some plants um, that taste delicious. On the top left is nasturtium. So it has like circular little leaves. We can find them in orange and yellows and reds, but they have a really peppery taste and they get even spicier when it's hot and dry in the summer. So a fun little plant to add to a salad or to eat. Um, we also have apple, apple tree. Um, this is a great plant to add structure, maybe some climbing, um, but it also shows the life cycle. So the, we all get to see the flower, the fruit development, and then harvest, and we get to enjoy the fruit. Um, this could go for, for really anything, any type of fruit. Chives are on the top right. Um, these hollow stems, some oniony flavor. Eat them as soon as you pick them. Um, you can also harvest the flowers as used as a garnish as well. Really pretty floral addition. Our bottom left um, are sun, our strawberries. Strawberries are really easy to grow here in central Illinois. Our day neutral and um, plants are, they're gonna produce throughout the growing season. They're also gonna be smaller berries. They're not gonna produce the, the runners like the other strawberries, so can contain them a little bit. Our center picture is mint. And those of you who garden are like, don't plant mint. Uh, but mint is really wonderful. We have our peppermint, our spearmint. You just want to be careful with this one. You want to put it in a pot so it doesn't spread. They spread by underground rhizomes and can take over this whole room in a matter of a couple of years. It's, it, it's intense. Um, so put it in a pot. It still is a very worthy plant. It has a great smell. You can also put a plant like a bottomless container in the ground so that the roots couldn't get through the, the container and spread if you didn't want to put it in a container. But just make sure you, you contain those rhizomes so they don't keep spreading. And then our cherry tomatoes, like, the cherry tomatoes are indeterminate, so they're, gonna, they're going to grow, they're gonna set flower, or they're gonna flower and they're gonna set fruit until it frosts. So they're gonna be kind of unruly, they're gonna be big, they're going to take up a lot of space, but there's nothing like harvesting a cherry tomato fresh from the garden and just popping it in your mouth. Uh, sun sugar is one of my favorites, just tastes like candy. So something that you could easily have in any, any sensory garden, very safe to have in there. Very prolific producers that, that um, would ha produce tomatoes all, all summer long for you. All right, so we have our, our five senses covered, our plants, and now it's time to dress up our garden with non-plant elements. So our hardscapes, our rocks. So our hardscapes would be like retaining beds or bunches, walls, our rocks. There's so many beautiful rocks, the different textures, the different colors that you could add. Uh, think about your pathways. Are they gonna provide, be covered in, in mulch? Are they gonna be concrete or rock? A lot of different ways that you could add um, texture and color to that. Um, interpretive signs, so this, these would have its place. Um, but it just in introduces maybe a concept or an activity for people to do in the garden, um, draw their attention to a plant. And then water features, water, having water in the garden or anywhere is so relaxing. Um, you have, visually it's pretty, you have the sound of the, the water trickling or moving, um, and then you touch it and it's nice and cool. So a lot of different senses involved in water. Um, it doesn't have to be a huge pond. It could be a little fountain. It could be um, a, a waterless or a pondless waterfall. Something, something simple. Um, and then we want to think about inviting our wildlife. So our our bird baths, our bird feeders, toad houses, um, just things that would um, increase the diversity of our wildlife in our garden to to have sound. Even crickets chirping, like. A lot of different insects, cicadas here coming up, um, make, make noise that could be interesting in the garden. Um, the next one, noise makers. You know, this would definitely have its place. Um, if you want a calming space, you wouldn't want loud noise makers, or maybe having a little room, or your garden room, where you have noise makers, but um, different things that could provide different sounds. And then a dig site. Maybe you're digging in the, you want to dig in the soil. I like, love digging in the soil. It's fun. Um, just different ways to connect with, it, with the nature. 
And then our last most important thing is embracing the exploration. You want to make people feel welcome. You want them to want to engage in the garden. You can, you can set some perimeters and say, well, we can't do this, but you want them to explore. You want them to pick and prod and smell because that's part of the learning process. That's part of the mindfulness process is to engage in the plant. So we don't want a garden that says, oh, don't touch that, don't pick that. We want to embrace that exploration. And it's okay if a plant gets, or flower gets picked, or something gets stepped on. That's, that's part of a sensory garden. So just a few sensory, okay. So a few sensory activities that you can do now that you have your garden, or maybe you're going to a garden. Um, this is a very, very simple one. You don't need anything besides what you have on. Um, connecting to your senses, our five fingers, you're gonna um, find your space in your garden and you're gonna think five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. So if you did that every time you stepped into your garden, can you imagine? Just building that appreciation, building that connection, um, and improving your, your well-being. Your sit spot, um, I remember I had a sit spot when I was a kid. I'd go sit by this little tree. This was my sit spot to, to relax, to unwind. Um, but a sit spot's really just a space in nature that you find to observe. It could be a bench. It could be under a tree. It could be by a lake. Um, but your sit spot's where you go to unwind and connect with nature. Um, and, and you can engage those senses at that time. So maybe putting a bench strategically in your, your sensory garden for your sen sit spot. Um, you can journal here, you can meditate here, you can do whatever you want in your sit spot, but it's, it's your space that you go to regularly to appreciate nature. And then sensory scavenger hunts, this is not just for kids. Anybody could do scavenger hunts and go and look for plants that smell really good or go and look for different textures or um, just any botanical characteristic, you can go on a scavenger hunt and be very mindful of what you're looking for and um, connect with nature through, through your different senses. Um, and this could, be, this could be anywhere. This could be backyard. This could be a park. It could be hiking somewhere. Absolutely. Some other ideas, we have nature journaling, so this promotes calmness while also providing that um, expression of creativity. Uh, tree and plant observations. There are so many cool trees and shrubs blooming right now that we just walk by. I'm so guilty of this. You're walking through a garden and you look like down at your feet because you don't want to trip on anything or you look straight ahead, but stop and look at these plants. Look at these botanical features. If it's the flower, the leaf, the bark, um, there's just so much to be uh, appreciate of these beautiful characteristics of, of plants, really unique characteristics. A birding, so birding increases our sense of hearing. Um, we're, we're listening for the birds, so this would be a, a great sense to just focus on, on what we're hearing around us, birding. Um, playing or digging in the soil, yeah, this is more than just like planting, but, but just playing in it. So if you dig in soil, it releases microbes. Those microbes can then produce serotonin and the serotonin makes us happier, makes us relaxed. So there is research that said just playing in the soil, digging in, in the soil um, can make us happier. So just maybe do that someday while you're, while you're bored. Um, nature photography is something very easy. A lot of people enjoy um, photography um, with wildlife, but just different characteristics of the plants, um, nature being very mindful of stopping and seeing what, um, what is around you and what are their characteristics. And then sound map, this is really just mapping what you hear around you. So you can first close your eyes and, and think about, well, I hear a bird over here, you hear a train back here, I hear water back here. So just mapping out what you hear at that time and just focusing on, on sound. Uh, so Illinois Extension does have a, a lot of resources on wellness and nature. I have a couple back here for you today. We have a, a sensory walk that you can take anywhere. This can be a, um, at a park or in your backyard. And then we have um, a few activity sheets that you could do as well. 
So we're, we're, we're trying to increase our resources with promoting wellness. It's so important, um, I think, for everybody to, to pr think about your health, your overall well-being. Um, but nature, I mean, it's right on our back door. We're so, so much to be thankful for. We need to get outside. Um, and then I do have a little activity back here if you'd like to make a lavender sachet. So this is an example of our, um, our smell, our, our sense of smell, using dried lavender to promote relaxation and, and calming. So you can do the rice, the lavender, and the oil in the little sachet bags. And you can put this anywhere. It's a, a, by your bed or in a closet, in a drawer. I have mine in my car. I like it better than like a car refresher. So um, just a little, a little treat that you can take some lavender home with you. Um, and I do want to close with this quote from Hannah Ryan, author and artist. So the greatest gift of the garden is the restoration of the five senses. And even if you're not going to go home and plant a sensory garden, I challenge you to go to a garden this summer and, and try some of these sensory activities or connect, engage your, your senses when you're there. Um, it, is, it is really calming and it is, you will notice a difference of your overall well-being for like, oh, like, it, it, it works. So I, I do encourage you to try this at some point, even if it's not in, a, in your backyard, in your own sensory garden. So you can engage your senses anywhere, and this is going to promote our, our overall health and well-being and to decrease our stress, um, which I know I could use. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. Do you have any questions about sensory gardens or plants that I talked about? Yeah. Questions? Hang on one second. I'm going to use the mic for the streaming. For the online people. Can you repeat what the um, type of strawberry you were suggesting that didn't grow as big? Yeah, the ever-bearing strawberry. Ever-bearing. Yep, it won't produce the, the big runners, and it will have a smaller strawberry, but um, great for, for small spaces. I also read recently that um, prairie drop seed has a popcorn smell, and I don't think I've ever mm. noticed that. I don't think I have either. There is a plant called popcorn plant, and you rub the, you can't find it very often in the garden centers, but you rub the leaves and, it sm and, and the flowers. It smells just like buttered popcorn. So popcorn plant is the common name of that one. Really cool. We got time for a few more. Any more questions? Ah, uh -huh. Randy, Randy has a question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, you showed us a favorite plant I don't know if you can go back a couple slides. I didn't catch what the name of it was. Tell me to stop. Right there on the this bottom right. Baptisia. What is it again? Baptisia. Baptisia. Uh -huh. It's very common in the garden centers. It um, is a native. It's very beautiful. It has a very um, like orderly structure. And it has like a greenish blue tint to it, bluish green. It's false blue indigo is another, I sometimes, you might have heard that, that's the common name. Uh, very, very pretty flower. There's also newer cultivars of yellow and I think white, so maybe some pink, so. Yeah, I say I have a lot, I say favorite, my favorite plant a lot. I have a lot of favorite plants. Um, asking a horticulturist their favorite plant is like asking a mom their favorite child. Um, just can't do it. Just, it's probably gonna depend on the day. Mm -hmm. This All right. Season. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So please come up here and, and yes. take a laugh. Yes, give Yes, please. Yep. Another round of applause. If there's no more questions. I, th I think we're good. You guys are ready to go out and, and, and build a sensory garden? I am. <laughs> I've got all my stuff yesterday, so. Um, yeah, so I just had a comment about the uh, rattlesnake master. You mm -hmm. said that was native to Illinois? It is, yeah. I, I had no idea. Yeah. So. It's a it's really, fantastic. It's, it looks so wicked, but it's a really neat plant. Yeah. yeah. Well, so again, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm going to invite you guys to just stick around if you have questions or, and check out some of the sensory experiences up here. And um, before we close, I want to remind you that um, this month we're going to have what we're going to consider a bonus program uh, because we typically do one lunch and learn a month. But on April 25th, we will have a special program a black woman's journey from cotton picking to college professor, lessons about race, class, and gender in the U.S. 
uh, with author Dr. Minna Pratt Clark. She is the daughter of the late Mildred Pratt, who was the founder of the Bloomington Normal Black History Project. And then we'll ask you to come back next month, May 9th, for everything you want to know about wind turbines with a, a area expert, uh, Megan Ria. Same time, same channel. Get growing. Thank you. <laughs>